The second mechanism of, of speciation or, or classification is maybe a better word is um, sympatric speciation. So where allo meant other, sim means together. So sympatric means that these are going to happen in an environment where they're not geographically isolated. They live in the same geographic area, but for some reason or another, there's something that's preventing or reducing gene flow. So here's our same pond of fish, right? They're all together in the same pond. Only now we don't develop any kind of isolating barrier um, over here. Something happens, with maybe we get a mutation in blue fish, um, and maybe it's just, you know, I, uh, mating preference, that now the bluefish like to mate with other bluefish. Um, something happens where we're going to get a separation between bluefish and orangefish, but they still, like, they're all living in the same pond together. Um, so that's going to be an example of sympatric. Allopatric, where they have the geographical isolation, is probably the most common mechanism for speciation. Sympatric is probably less common, and it's, it's got a few different types of, of ways that this can happen. So one way that this can happen is through polyploidy. So think back to genetics, right? You know haploid and you know diploid. Diploid means you have two sets of every chromosome. Haploid means you have one set of every chromosome. So poly means many. So a polyploid is going to have many sets of chromosomes, typically in excess of two. So you could be triploid and have three. You could be tetraploid. You could have four. You could be hexaploid. You could be octoploid. You could be dodecaploid and have 12 sets of, of chromosomes. Um, and this just happens because of accidents during meiosis. Um, so the polyploidy is, is much more common in plants than animals. And polyploidy tends to be a better, uh, results in better offspring than like individual monosomies or trimosomies, um, because what's happening is all of the genes are still expressed at the same ratio. So in animals, this is not very accessible. This usually results in a non-viable offspring. However, in plants, we can see fertile viable offspring that happen when this, this occurs. So it can result in a brand new biological species in plants in a single generation because now this plant is genetically distinct from either of its parents. And if it can continue to reproduce asexually and create a robust amount of them, they might even be able to develop um, sexual reproduction. So a lot of the crops and, and plant products that you're familiar with are polyploid. So, for example, apples, bananas, ginger, and watermelon are all triploid. And these are the ones that you find in the grocery store. Um, cotton, potato, leeks, tobacco, and peanuts are mostly tetraploid. Red wheat um, and oats are hexaploid. And most strawberries and sugarcane are octoploid. So this is common. Like, this, we, we see this a lot. Um, you can become polyploid through the process uh, called autopolyploid. And so this is going to happen um, when an individual is going to create offspring um, from the same species, right? So here we've got a diploid cell, 2n is equal to 6, right? We have two sets of each of these three chromosomes. Something happens. We have a cell division error where maybe there's a non-disjunction during meiosis. We end up with um, a 4n um, cell. So now I have four sets of chromosomes. Meiosis occurs. We create gametes that are 2n. If those gametes form together, you could see how this could happen on plants that do self-fertilization. Um, if these gametes somehow fuse, we create an offspring that's now 4n, and that's going to have twice as many chromosomes as the original parent. So if you think about the term, auto means self, poly is many, and ploidy is the number of chromosomes. So auto polyploid means that I'm resulting with many sets of chromosomes from errors and divisions in my own single species, myself. Allopolyploidy 
happens when there's two separate species. So an allopolyploid is um, species with different numbers of sets of chromosomes come together and create a hybrid. So here's species A. We'll say this is the same species from the previous slide. Um, we do normal meiosis. So we go from 2n, which is 6, to 1n, which is 3. That's one gamete. This is a different species of plant. I'm going with plants here. Um, and the 2n number for this species is 4. So the normal gamete for this species has 2. Somehow, there's no gametic isolation between these two species. They form a sterile hybrid zygote. Um, if somehow this hybrid zygote doubles in number, which some plants can do, um, it can create a new viable fertile offspring, which could potentially mate with itself. Um, it usually cannot mate with either of the parent species because now these uh, G, the, the chromosome numbers between this new species and the parent species are so different, they're not going to end up having a viable offspring. But a lot of times what happens is this will mate asexually with itself and, and propagate, and then eventually be able to mate sexually within itself um, from different organisms, um, different parts of the same organism, and then produce viable offspring that can uh, continue to populate. We can also see sexual selection as a driver of sympatric speciation, and this is maybe more of you know what could have happened in that fish population. So an example of sexual selection, we've got the cichlids from Lake Victoria, and in Lake Victoria there are a huge diversity of coloration of cichlids. So you've got from like drab black and white to this bright blue and orange one, and they tend to select mates based on their own coloration. So what happens over a long period of time is there's no gene flow between the black and white one and the purple and blue one, or orange and blue one, sorry. And eventually they're going to separate into completely separate species who can no longer mate together even if they wanted to. Another thing that can happen is um, the habitat differentiation. So we talked about this a little bit with um, uh, these flies. So we have new ecological niches that appear. So for example, if we have the North American maggot fly, which lives on hawthorn trees and eats the fruits on those trees, um, it, it would be well adapted to that environment. If a new niche arrives in the same environment, so we bring in apple trees. They're not native. We put them in the ground. We plant them next to the hawthorn trees. And now all of a sudden, there's apples. So the maggot fly, some of them might go populate the apple trees and then prefer to stay on the apple trees. And so eventually, because they move to a different habitat, um, will develop different habitat preferences, temporal isolation, um, different mating practices, something else, one of those reproductive isolating barriers will, will pop up. Um, but we consider this sympatric because there's no geological barrier. Theoretically, a hawthorn fly could go to an apple tree or an apple maggot fly could go to a hawthorn tree, but they don't because of their instinctual preferences that keep them apart.